simple Revit uh, structural steel model and uh, then read all that data inside uh, or using Rhino inside Grasshopper Rhino and Grasshopper through Rhino inside Revit and hopefully try to set some project parameters and type parameters and then extract those project and type parameters from inside the Grasshopper window so that we could start so that we could begin to build some sort of database that we could export out to Excel and then hopefully at some point visualize using Power BI. So this is a, um, a video in a series of videos that I'm hoping it will all culminate in about four or five hours of uh, lessons. And uh, with that in mind, I think we should just dive in. So before we start, I, I kind of gathered all these files for you just in case you don't have like as part of your Revit download installation process, some of the families weren't downloaded or the templates or if you're using VPN, it's very slow. So I created, I downloaded all these files for you and compressed them inside this class session files. And this class session files I placed on the project server under the class uh, folder, course material, references, session notes, and there goes the compress uh, folder. So you can unzip that at any point and then access all these files. So the crucial part, the crucial file in this list is this construction default.rte. This is a Revit template file that I would strongly recommend you, you using as a starting basis for starting a project and starting this project in Revit. Of course, if you're working for an office or if you have your own template, you can use those. I don't really care, but I like to start out with kind of a bare bones, you know, just a basic out of the box Revit template so that it doesn't have a lot of um, customization in it. In addition to that file, I also downloaded some families, structural uh, column and framing families that I would recommend you load into your project after you open up. And the other thing is I created this uh, shortcut here for your Revit default paths, file and folder paths. This is for your templates and family, your, your project templates, family templates, and then your library uh, catalogs. So you could just see how Revit organizes all that in, in case you can't find it as part of your default. So with that in mind, uh, let's go ahead and start. If you fire up Revit, you should just see this flash screen and we want to click on new. And then I want to browse for my template file. Hopefully on your screen, this won't take as long. I actually attempted this video uh, right before this recording and it crashed my, it crashed my computer. And I think this is causing me a lot of, um, a lot of trouble because I'm using a lot of a lot of VPN or remote connection services, so it's just taxing my bandwidth and my computer on top of trying to live stream a video. But hopefully I will at least be able to select this template. So I'm going to navigate to wherever I saved that template for you is going to be a bit different and then open it. And then the crucial step here is to make sure that um, project uh, project is selected not project template if you select accidentally pr select project template and say okay that will open the template file and we don't want to open the template file we want to use it as a basis to create a new Revit project so let's say okay here and that should ignore this screen here we'll go back to it in a bit that should create a new uh, project file for you project 2 you could just uh, right away file save as and save it to wherever you desire with some unique name. So just do file, save as project, and you could just navigate to a folder. Uh, before we continue on, let me let me see if I could expedite some of this a bit all right I think this should probably get us going so before I continue I'm gonna kind of clean up these views I don't want any of these views I'm not gonna use them I don't want them to bog my model and so on so let's just uh, delete them 
And uh, let's go scroll down to families and under structural columns and structural framing. I want to also delete the families that are available there. I know it says W shape, but this is not actually a smart structural um, family, uh, structural column family or framing family. These are just Revit defaults and they're not the right ones to use. And then the other thing I want to do is go to my north view and I basically want to delete, um, let's see, I want to delete all of these and then I'm going to rename some of these. So I'm going to name this level ground and yes, we label that. And then this is going to be top of um, footin. And this is going to be top of canopy. And this is going to be top of scoreboard. Right, so now I could just actually delete these views and then go to view, plan view, floor plan, and then just select all of these and recreate them. And now you have all of your correct floor plan views. So I'm not going to actually attempt to load the families in this live stream, but you should do that on your own. Once you do, you will see that your, uh, in, inside your family, uh, family, Inside the project browser under families, you will see that the white flange column family is loaded um, and C channel family and then hollow structural section and white flange frame and family are also loaded. And I just loaded these types. You can load whatever types you desire. I don't, I don't really care. And so to start modeling the structure, let's, uh, let's just delete this and let's rebuild it. If objects are pinned, you can't delete them in Revit. So I started out, I'm going to delete these as well, and I'm going to go to ground, my ground level. So I always like to start out, those of you that have had classes with me will know that I always start out with a grid. There is no way I'll, I do anything without a grid. So I'm going to label this one and two. And then, by the way, to get to the grids, you go to architecture tab, datum, grid and then I want to basically create again you could create whatever sample structure you want I don't really care this is just what I'm doing for this tutorial or for this um, session I would advise you to keep your the distances between your grids kind of straightforward honestly if, if you start using fractions I don't know, just don't use that many fractions. That's, that's, that's a good rule to just always apply. So now I want to place columns at the grid. So I'm going to go to structure and click on column. And on, inside my um, type uh, drop down menu, I can select the column that I want. So I'm going to do this W33 by 169 column. And I can just simply hover over and place this column on my grid intersection. So I'm going to go to my 3D view. And here are my columns. I don't know. I think there's a section box on here, and this is why I'm not seeing all of them. So I want to select all these columns and say, uh, I'm going to say they, they're going from the top of foundation to my top of scoreboard. How's that? So we can give them more, more of depth. And then I'm going to change these two to a W24 by 68. And then these to a W21 by 48. And then I'm going to drop these, the top offset of these, to the top of canopy. So now I'm going to go to top of canopy. And now I want to create beams. And I'm going to start out by creating a beam using a W21 by 47. And I'm going to simply create a beam from here to here, from here to here. You see that. By default, Revit kind of tries to adjust things graphically so that they could appear to look correct. This doesn't always follow the rule like, well, I guess in this case it actually did, but sometimes it won't follow these rules and things will goof off. And in 3D, it kind of looks correct. Again, it's Revit's trying to do quite a bit. So sometimes if these connections don't look correct, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't be that alarmed. 
So from the crop, well, actually, I want to change these to, not these, actually, these to W18 by 211. And then I want to create more beams across using a hollow structural section. I'm going to go from here to here and from here to here. I'm going to change this back to a 14120 and go from here to here. So you see my structure is kind of slowly but surely building. So now I want to extend my structure a little bit outside my grid. So let's get a W18211 and go from here out about, let's say, 9 feet. There it is. Now I'm going to go to top of scoreboard and basically repeat the same process to continue on building this structure. And again, I'm, I'm not really using um, structural shapes based on structural engineering principles. Like I, I don't, I don't think that should be a worry at this point. I'm just really trying to create a structure as a starting point for what we're going to do in Grasshopper. So this is starting to look like something. I want to add a little bit more detail to this. So I'm going to go back to the top of canopy, and now I want to add a a tube here let's do a six by six tube and the reason I'm using a lot of different types of um, it's not that many but I want to I want to I want to vary the types essentially this is what I want to do I, I don't want to create the same type I'm actually going to switch this to a 10 by 10 and then if you notice that if we go to the side view here in the 3d view and switch this to wireframe if you notice that this is top justified to be at the top of this um, eye section and I want to actually center justify this. So if you, while this um, hollow structural section is selected, you could just click on, um, let's see, origin. And then if this is a W18, I basically want to give this a, a negative nine inch offset at each level, or at least they're about, right? Yeah, I think that's, that's correct. Um, it doesn't look exactly centered, so what I would do there is I would basically create a section here. And then go to the preview in the section. And what you could do is just simply measure the actual depth of the section. So you see it's a little bit more... I did select the W18, but the W18 was a bit more than W18. So when I measured this section here, I then copied this dimension so that I won't have to remember it. And then on my start level offsets, I can type in equals, paste in that dimension, divided by two, and then copy this formula and paste it into here. You see it's gonna go above because I forgot to type in a negative value. Well, I can just go back in and type in a negative value That still didn't do it. Well, that's interesting. Let's see. I guess the other way to do this is to just copy that. I don't know why that didn't work. It's kind of frustrating, but I, think, I guess it's fine. I think that should do it. So there it is centered, and then the other thing I want to do is basically left align this face, like so. And then let's just copy this from level to level. So then if we go back to our top of canopy, we have this, this hollow structural section. And what I want to do is array some C-channel columns across it. So let's do column, C channel. Let's look at the C channel and see what is its. So this is going from, to, from ground to top of canopy. I want to change its um, offsets from to top of scoreboard, from top of canopy to top of scoreboard. And then I want it to extend below the top of canopy by that much. 
So make sure to switch this to a negative value. There it is. So now let's go back to top of canopy or top of, yeah, top of canopy. Now I want to align the face of this C channel to the face of this tube. And then I also want to give this a specific distance and that distance is going to be three feet. And I'm going to copy this all the way across and then give that a specific distance from the center of my tube. I want to snap to the center of my channel as well. And that's going to be three feet. And now I want to array these. Let's see, let's get like 10 of them. Let's uncheck group and associate. Let's do an array. And then to equally space them, I would click on that first channel, click on the last one, and then click on everyone in between. I apologize if I'm going fast. For some of you that are not that familiar with Revit, I'm operating under the assumption that all of you are fairly familiar with Revit. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of resources out there, namely really through Revit University, that you could use to understand better understand Revit. So now, if we go back to the 3D, we should begin to see a you know. Not a state of the art, straight art, state of the art structure, but something that will do for now. Um, all right. So with that in mind, let's uh, save this file. I would always save the file. So save it as sample structure or whatever you want to save it as. I shouldn't have clicked on that. So just save it as sample structure. And let's go to add-ins just like last time and click on the Rhino WIP. That's work in progress. You may or may not get this Grasshopper loading errors. I have a lot of plugins um, downloaded with Grasshopper, and this is why I get some of these errors. So then um, once, you, once that gets fired up, that should create a new Rhinoceros tab. And in that, you can click on Grasshopper, and we should get Grasshopper to come up. There it is. Sweet. I'm so glad it didn't crash it. There's obviously this Rhino inside, and Rhino 7 is all, the WIP stands for work in progress. So there's still a lot of bugs and a lot of errors in it that uh, McNeil and Associates are constantly trying to figure out. All right, so we have our Grasshopper window. Now what we want to do is read all that, all those, all those, all that data into our Grasshopper window. So one way that I showed you last time is to go to params and uh, under... With, with the, with the built-in Rhino work in progress and Grasshopper, um, they created a new toolbar for you under the params tab that's called Revit. And underneath that, there's a geometric element component that we can get and right-click on it and say, set multiple Revit geometric elements. So now we could just basically do a bottom right to top left crossing window and then click on finish. And now we have all these Revit geometric elements. Let's preview what's inside this container. And you could see that it just says Revit geometric element and it's type, right? Like, but the, this is not just a, a, a string of, 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 of characters or just text. This is actually a smart Revit element. As I said last time, that you could actually expand all of the properties of these elements. So you could do list, list item, and just list the first element. Right, so this, this container, the elements that I selected now are stored in what Grasshopper calls a tree. 
it's a tree of data and in this case is just a tree with a single branch and the reason I know it's a single branch is because this curly brackets uh, branch path there aren't any more of it so if, if I expand this tree it's only a single branch another way of visualizing how many branches in a tree is to go to params utility and get a param viewer and plug the output of this container into the input of param viewer and double click on that and you'll see that it'll show you that this is a tree with a single branch that's that's all it is so it's a tree with a single branch and that tree has 34 items it starts at 0 and ends at 33 so each item has a unique index identifier to it and that index identifier is listed for you to the left of this line inside this panel viewer so what I what I did with this list item list item component is I basically told Grasshopper to list the first item of this branch inside this component and this is what's being previewed right now so I do that a lot instead of having to operate on the entire list I try to test some scripts or functions on a single item and a lot of times that if something works on a single item it's likely to work on the whole item but I'm not taxing my computer with all this processing power so to get this component the list item you go to sets list list item and then plug pull if you hover over the output of the Revit geometric elements container it'll give you this squiggly line with an arrow you can click and drag a wire and then click or hover over or get close to the input of the list item and then it'll snap to it and then let go of your mouse so that's how you connect two components alright so now we listed an item now if we want to preview what's actually stored in this Revit geometric element the fastest way to do this or the quickest way to do this is to go to the Revit tab that um, McNeil Associates installed as part of the Revit default or the Rhino Inside default package and under document you can just say I'm sorry under element you can say um, element decompose and you can click uh, connect the output of the list item into the input of the element decompose and then right click on that and say get all parameters and you see here are all the parameters that are listed inside that element so there's something that's stored in each value. You see top offset, it says 0 foot 0. Base offset says 0 foot 0. Top level, it says it's schedule. It's, there's, there's an element, there's some sort of parameter that's defined in there. So you can actually begin to preview some of these values. You see it says top of scoreboard, base level, top of foundation. I don't know yet which element this is. So one way of identifying which element this is, I like to fire up my Rhino Previewer, actually. And inside my Rhino Previewer, since I called, or since I um, brought in elements inside my Grasshopper, my Rhino Previewer now some reason I can't zoom in so this is showing me this column and this is how this is one quick way of identifying which item I'm selecting all right so we've built a structure and we've called it into grasshopper what I want to do now is basically find a way to kind of begin to apply specific parameters to these structures but before I manipulate any of these parameters these are the default parameters that kind of became built into uh, Revit. What I want to do is create my own type parameters and project parameters. So to create a project parameter, you go to Manage and click on Project Parameter. You should not see this index parameter. I kind of created that prior to this video. So your view, your dialog of project parameters should look something similar to this. And now we want to click on Add to add a parameter and this is asking you if this is going to be a type or an instance parameter so an instance parameter is going to be applied to every instance of the project for that specific category of elements and a type parameter is going to be applied at the type level right so if I have uh, a 36 by 80 door and there's 10 of those well there's one type of that door namely 36 by 80 but there's 10 instances of that door so if there is a specific so let's just say a material finish a door's material finish could potentially change from door to door 
that material finish parameter would be applied as an instance parameter rather than a type parameter because that parameter is going to change from instance to instance. But for example, the 36 inch width of the door, that should be a type parameter because that's a, uh, a parameter that gets applied to all of the doors if they're going to be all 36 inches. In this case, I want to create an instance parameter and the type of parameter is going to be a text and I'm going to group that under um, identity data. Let's see, where's identity data? There it is. Uh -oh. And I'm going to name this parameter index. So this is going to be um, the unique index that I'm going to use Grasshopper to generate to then apply to every element. And then I want to tell Revit which model categories I want you to apply this type parameter, or I'm sorry, instance parameter to. So in this case, I want it to apply to structural framing and structural columns only. So make sure, make sure you click on check none, and then click on structural framing and structural columns only. And say OK. Say OK. So now if you click on any element, you can see that the parameter index could be found here. Let's undo that. Let's go back to project parameters and actually delete that index parameter and say OK. If you select a column or a framing element, you notice that under identity data, there is no index parameter. So after you actually go through the process of creating an index parameter, you will see it would come up under identity data. So it's right there. And it's the same thing with the framing. So this will be a, um, this is a project parameter. To create a type parameter, we actually have to, a type parameter for that specific family, we actually have to edit the family. And in this case, what I want to do, uh oh, I want to go to the project uh, family type properties dialog, right? So after I end the project, I should select the column and click on edit family. And then the, the family gets opened as a actual family file. This, if you notice here, it says .rfa, not RTE or RVT. So this is a family file. And inside that, under Create Properties toolbar, there is Family Types, Family Categories, and Parameters. We want to click on Family Types. And notice that under Family Types, um, I have all these type parameters. So you see these type parameters change from type to type. Now, other than uh, under the type name, this says um, W18 by 76, I really don't have any other way to kind of get what kind of structural shape that is, whether it's a W or a C or a T or so on. Actually, now that we're on that subject, there is another structural shapes link that I gave you, and here's all the possible structural shapes available based on the AISC manual, right? So under the I shape family, they come in W, S, M, and HP. Under the C, they come in C and MC and so on. So you can study this as much as you want. What I'm, what I'm wanting to do is under this W shape, I want to create a type parameter. I don't want to rely on the type name here because anybody in the project could come in and edit that type name. And I don't want to edit the actual profile or, or AISC section profile type if that type name gets edited. So I want to create a new parameter. So click on this new parameter dialog box. And in this case, this is going to be a family parameter and it's going to be a type. And under here, I'm going to type in section profile. And it's going to be a text parameter, and I'm going to group that also under identity data. And say OK. So for this, for this type, it's going to be a W. For the other type, it's also going to be a W, and so on. So you can, you can fill in that um, value, that parameter value here, say OK, and then load it back into the project. And you should not say override the existing version and its parameter. You should just say override the existing that's available. 
Now, if we um, go down all the way in our project uh, families, project browser families category, if we double click, double click on one of the columns, we should see the section profile with W. And then I also added the W for the 2148. Now we want to add it for, oh, it already added it here as well. Oh, I didn't think that would add it here, but I guess it did. So now we want to do the same thing for the framing, the um, C channel family, and the tube family. So let's just take a couple of minutes to do that. It should be pretty much the same process over and over again. I strongly recommend that you actually do that over and over again. Make sure that whatever you put in here, section profile, it's exactly the same spelling, um, 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 letter case, and spacing. It has to be exactly the same. Let's do text and then group that under identity data. And this is going to be a type. And in this case, this is going to be a W. Say OK. Load into project. OK. And now I want to kind of work my way through and add it to the um, C channel column family. Under identity data. And then we have one more, and then we should be done. We have our hollow structural section frame and family. This is going to be HSS. Say OK. Load into project. This is probably a good time to save. All right, so now back to our grasshopper window. I want to actually close out of all these families. I don't want to save them. I don't want to save over my original families. Once the family is reloaded into Revit, the current Revit document will hold the latest um, iteration of that family. So I don't typically save my families, not unless I'm trying to um, replicate them out to an office or a team or a group or whatever. So now let's go back to our grasshopper. And if we click here, we should see index come up. Let's click here and click play, and that would recompute. So we have our identity data index that came up, and then we should also see section profile somewhere, if I did everything correctly at least. Maybe these are all just um, type, I'm sorry, um, pro project parameters and not project specific. I'm sorry, um, I'm family specific. Yeah, so we have our index. So let's just plug our index into this panel. And what we could do is right click on this and say remove unconnected parameters. And that way we could preview our index. Now, I did say that you could just select elements, but another more efficient way I find, especially if you're, you, if you're dealing with only um, one structural system, in this case it's just steel, it's not steel and concrete or steel, wood and concrete and so on. There's another way to actually get all the relevant model information without having to select it. Let's kind of explore this, this other technique for just a couple of minutes. So if you go to the Revit tab that's built into the Grasshopper from Rhino inside, and we can go to Document and Document Categories. Now we can plug that into this panel. We can see that this is, this is listing all the available document categories here. And what we want is the structural framing stored at index 66 and structural columns stored at index 61. So let's list these two. I'm going to go to list, list item. And I'm going to right click on index, set multiple indexes, and it's 61 and 66. So if I hover over here, it should just give me structural columns and structural framing. All right, so now if I go back to my Revit tab, um, I could get a, let's see, I can do document elements, go to document, document elements, and 
the input of document elements, it says it's a filter. So what we want to do is kind of filter the document elements based on our category type. So we want to create a filter. So go to filter tab and say, I want an element category filter. And then plug the um, output of this list item into this uh, input of element category filter. And that should create a filter for you. And then you can plug that into here. And notice if you hover over, it says 34 locally defined values. So this is, I think in my opinion, more well, it's more efficient in this case because we're only using 34, val 34 values. If this is a giant airport project where there is, you know, 85,000 members, you should probably consider otherwise. But in this case, and in I think many local cases, this is probably a more efficient way of doing this. So now let's um, preview what's stored inside this identity data index and it says no. That means there's nothing in it, right? Not that there's zero in it or that it's empty. No, it's actually nothing. Like an empty list is a list that doesn't contain something, but the list is active. In this case, that this is telling me that there's absolutely nothing in it. It's null. Um, the difference between a zero, empty, and null list um, is just nuances of like computer science lingo. We can probably dive into in a, in a different date or a different tutorial. Or if you're really interested, you could just Google the difference between zero, empty, and null, and you'll get it. For this purpose, I think it's just fine knowing that null is going to not have anything. All right. So now we have all of our elements. Um, if we want to preview our elements in our Rhino window, another way of doing that is to go to element and we can get element geometry. And under LOD here, LOD here stands for level of development. You can right click and say fine and click uh, plug in the, elevate, uh, the element output from the elements as a list or I'm sorry, uh, from the document elements container. And we should see all of our elements. Now in this case, this is previewing something a bit different. You see it says close BREP. So this is now actually, I could take this and turn it into, I have no idea why this is not zooming in. I can take this and turn it into a, a, a um, baked in Revit geometry if I want to. I'm sorry, uh, Rhino geometry. So I can take this, uh, click my mouse wheel on it and then say bake into my Revit window. I can turn off my uh, uh, Grasshopper Previewer, and you see now I actually can view this as Revit or uh, my Rhino geometry. So I can do all. I mean, I could, I could, I could delete it. I could push things. I could manipulate them. I could scale them to test out different iterations before I kind of actually apply those changes in Revit. So this is what that um, that element that geometry uh, component or container does for you. All right, so we're going to go back. We're going to extract that um, section profile type later. But for right now, let's actually generate a list of unique indexes for every element. So the list of unique index, this is how I want to generate an index. I want to list out a type, underscore, location, underscore, ID. And so the type is going to be either a W or um, an HSS or a C and so on. A location is where this thing is located. So on uh, precisely along which grids or which levels and so on. And then an ID, if there are multiple elements on that same level, well, we want to generate a unique number identifier that identifies every element. All right. So this is kind of the template for our index. Let's just keep it here for now. Okay, so the type we need to kind of extract, let's try to extract that type. So if we go to Revit, document, I'm sorry, element, and then say get parameter, element parameter git. So the element that I want to operate on is this element outputs from the document.elements container, and then the parameter key is going to be the parameter that I typed in into my type properties. So this is going to be section profile. I really hope this works. I don't know. I actually have not tried to extract. Uh-oh, it's going to crash it. 
If this crashes at any point, I will actually just pause. Oh, there we go. I will just pause the video and resume it, just FYI. So this is telling me it's null, and now I'm becoming aware that uh, creating a type parameter inside, I'm hesitant to say that it's not possible to read that in Grasshopper. As of right now, I actually don't know how to do that myself. So what I want to do instead is just go back to my manage window and do project, um, project parameters. And let's just create a new parameter called section profile. It's going to be instance and it's going to be a text and let's group that under identity data and let's apply that to structural framing and structural columns and say okay say okay so now if i select an element i should see section profile available there and section profile available here so one way to actually add in this value so this is w i could just simply select each one and say well this is a w apply all right, but this is not this is not a really efficient way of doing it. Again, for this small project, there's only 34 members. There's, it's probably pretty quick to select all the W framing elements and type in a W. But what I want to what I want to do is have Grasshopper do that for me. So let's 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 go back to Grasshopper. So this is the section profile. I want to disconnect it from this one and delete that one. And I want to set a profile, I'm sorry, set a parameter. So if you go to the Revit tab, element, and we want to do element parameter set. So the element that I want to set is this one. Before I just simply plug it in, what I want to do is create a condition, uh, not a condition, a, a process so that I could control one, when a grasshopper is actually computing. So let's just go to sets tree and get a stream filter and if we go to back to params tab input and get a boolean toggle and plug that into this g or gate input you notice that when it's false this is um the stream is zero when it's true it flips to one so what i want to do is take the elements out of the document elements container and plug that into one so that when I flip this to true, it processes one. When I flip this back to false, it processes stream zero, which has nothing plugged into it. And that way I can control one grasshopper is going to actually compute the process. So I can now plug that into the input of my elements, um, um, element.set parameter, I'm sorry, element.parameter set so then the um, key, the parameter key is going to be the section profile and the value is going to be whatever value. So this will be a W, this will be HSS, this will be a C and so on. So the, 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 the quickest way to get that, and this is assuming that every type name is correct. So if I go back, let's, let's kind of delete this one. Let's keep this one on the side just in case we want to go back to it later. Let's go back to our Revit tab and do Revit Decompose. Actually, no, sorry, not Revit Decompose. Um, element Identity and plug the elements output into this elements input of element identity. And this gives you a type name, element type, and a category, I believe. So we want to process this type name. And you see that the first letter or Everything after the first number, before the first number, is the type, the section profile type that we want to apply to that parameter. So we want to find a way to kind of actually process this list so that we could eliminate everything after the letter's output. All right, so it's going to be a bit tricky because not all of them, we're not reading the first letter of every string here. It's in this case is the first letter. In this case is the first three, not letters, characters. And in this case is back to the first character. So how do we do that? Let's see. Let's see. I think what we could do is first split. And notice that some of them are capital X and some of them are lower X. So when things are not that consistent, it becomes kind of tricky to process this list. Let's see. Um, 
So in this specific list, I know that all of them are going to be a single character except for this HSS. So what I can do is convert this output into a string of text, go to params, primitive, text, and plug that into here. So now this is a string of text and not a Revit uh, type, uh, type parameter. Now what I could do is basically split this list from HSS to everything else. So I could say, I could go to set text and do match text. And the text that I want to operate on is the output of this text container. And the text wildcard pattern that I want to test against is if you double click on the canvas, uh, grasshopper canvas, and type in open quotations, HSS, capital HSS, enter. That gives you a panel with HSS already in it. Now we can plug that into the wildcat wildcard pattern, and that should give us a Boolean pattern, and it didn't. Yeah. Why is that? Okay, I actually know why. Let's see. Let's let's type in an asterisk here. Nope. There it is. Sweet. So the HSS asterisk. This is telling me that I want you to look for HSS only asterisk and nothing else. Like I don't. There's probably a more efficient way using. Um, regex patterns but i'm not really familiar with regex patterns for right now so for right now we're going to have to just you know deal with this kind of laborsome system so now i have a true or false bullying list true or false list that basically separates out my hss's from my w's and c's and i could now split this list i can use this pattern to kind of separate this original list into the w's and the c's from the hss so we can go to set list and do list dispatch. And the list that I want to operate on is going to be my text, my original text list. And the pattern that I want to have it sift through is going to be this pattern from this component. And now if we preview what's in A, it's giving me only my HSS. And what's in B, it's giving me my W's and C's. So now what I could do is, since I know that there is this one, I need the first three characters, H, S, S, and then this one, I just need the first, either it's a W or a C. What I could do is go to text and say, I want to uh, break, break text into individual characters, this component right here. And then if I preview what's inside that, you see it's created a tree with four branches. I can right click on this and simplify the branch path here. So there's zero, one, two, and three, four branches. And each branch has, <clears throat> you know, zero to X number of items in it. In this case, it's 11, but it's not necessarily going to be always 11, depending on the type of HSS section that we chose. And now what we want to do is list just the first three characters of this. So we would just want to list the HSS so we can go to list item and I want to list multiple uh -oh. right click on I here and say set multiple integers so I'm going to do 0 1 and 2 and then plug that output into here and you see now I have a list with just these three and now I could just go back to text and say text join and this takes a list of text uh, uh, text characters or text fragments and joins them. So now I could say I could do the same thing for my W. Only this is not going to be zero one two. It's just going to be zero. And I actually don't want to join it because it's only one letter. So there you have it. Um, let's see, there's something, something throwing me off here. So if I combine these two lists now, how do we know what we need to do is have each W be listed mm -hmm. 
Let's see. There might be an easy way to do this. Oh, I got it. Okay, sweet. So let's let's fly on this list, and let's fly on this list. And now I want to apply this pr these the set of parameters to all of my HSS tubes, and these to all of my W and C sections. So what I want to do is separate that original Revit list, my elements, into the same pattern. So now I have all of my A's. This is my HSS, and my B's are going to be my W's and C's. And here I want two of these things. Actually, let's let's be a bit smart about this. So let's get a a um, entwine component. So go to set tree entwine. And basically, what we're going to do here is we create this list. So I'm going to plug A and B here, and now we have two trees. I'm sorry, two a single tree, two branches. Each branch has the HSS and then it has the W's and the C's separately. So now I want to create the same entwine or tree structure for my uh, keys or parameter values. You see it says 4 and 30, 4 and 30. So the the elements that I want to feed into my one stream here and my stream filter component is going to be the one out of this flattened or uh, um, entwined component and then the keys that I want to feed is going to be from here. Let's save this before we continue because this might crash it. So if we click on true here, it should um, process something and apply a parameter. Let's click on false so that we can end that. And now if we go back, let's minimize this window and minimize right now. Now if we go here to this frame in profile, we should see section profile W, that's W, that's HSS, and that's C. So that worked. Success. That's awesome. I don't know what's happening to my Rhino and up there it is. Sweet. All right, so now we have a full script that kind of takes takes um, Revit geometric elements. Let's keep that on this. Uh, let's just delete that for now. Delete that one. I don't want to have a lot of stuff. When elements appear in orange with Rhino inside, it's fine. That doesn't mean you're doing an error. I mean, this is appearing in orange. If we right-click and read the warning, it says input parameter E failed to collect data. Well, that's because I'm, it says false here, and there's nothing plugged into the zero stream. So that, that kind of makes sense why it's orange. Here it's orange because something got processed and, you know, it says that this is not an absolute Revit element anymore, but it's fine. I think you could just refresh or, you know, you could open, close and open the file and that will, that will solve that problem. All right, so we just went through a script that takes the Revit structural steel elements, structural framing and structural columns elements. It um, separates out the type name and rebuilds the tree structure so that it, ass it assigns the section profile type based on the unique element that's inside Revit. Now we want, now that we have all of these unique, um, unique types, what we want to do is start building our index. So I know from this 
index um, index breakdown here that the first item in my index is going to be the type and the second is going to be a location so the location I like to locate by level so let's um, let's go back and repeat that element or the the um, private geometry thing again so go to element element geometry and plug the elements into here actually what I want to do is plug I want to create them. I want to, from now on, always use this list because my my data is is my 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 original list is kind of restructured. It's not just a single list or a tree a tree of a single branch with thirty four items. Now it's a tree of two branches with thirty four items. The first branch has four, and the second has thirty. So I want to kind of feed off of that from now on, and not the original one. And then switch this to fine. And now I have my B rep at every at every condition. Now what I want to do is let's let's basically I want to find a for columns I want to find the bottom point and for the beams or the framing elements I want to find the center. So let's let's preview this in our Rhino window. So here it is in our Rhino window. Now you can see that this is just my column element and if I explode this, if I go to surface, analysis, um, deconstruct BREP, this will explode it in every possible face of a column. So you see each element has anywhere from 10 to 18 faces, anywhere from 24 to 48 edges, and anywhere from 16 to 32 points. That's too much. I don't want to think about processing all that data. So what I want to do instead actually is go to surface primitive and I want to do a bounded box. And I want to do a bounded box per object. So you see now I have just a simple box bounded around each object. And now I want to deconstruct this box. So now I have the individual faces. Each box is going to have six. And I want to list the square area of the box, right? So this box here has six faces, and I know that the two smallest surface areas are going to correspond to the either bottom and top or left and right of a column or frame and element respectively. So let's go to analysis and do area and plug the face output into the G input of area. And now we could analyze the area. You see, this is giving me the area per face. And I know that the smallest two are the, the smallest two surfaces on each bounded box. So what I could do is just sift this uh, or reorganize this, this list here that, so it can go from smallest to largest. So I can go to sets, list, and I can do sort list. So this is sorting this list from largest to smallest. Now what I could do here is sort of list of values, similar values, kind of in, in synchrony with this component. So I can sort the faces, and now all of my faces are kind of listed from smallest to largest. And now if I go to set list item, I could list the first two items of every list. I can hover over here and do that. And this is giving me the smallest two surfaces of each one. You see my right of viewport? Now the last step to get the actual center, the centroid of these. Actually, I just I just learned, I just noticed that even there's a more efficient. So what I was going to do is go to surface and do square, uh, M squared or area squared again, and basically get the square area of each one. And now I can use that square area to go to curve, line, two point, and plug the curve, the centroid of each one, and I can recreate the center of my geometry. Right, and, <coughs> excuse me.
excuse me, sorry. <clears throat> so I could do that, but there's another way to do that because this is already giving me the center point of each surface. And instead of filtering out the face geometry and synchrony <clears throat> with my area, I could just plug that into here and then plug that into here and then delete these two and that should give me the same thing. So that kind of saved me a couple of components, which is kind of nice. I always like to, if I could simplify my script into just uh, two or three components, I will. Like that's, that's the rule I essentially apply to myself. And notice that as I, as I was moving along in my script, I always try to organize things and keep them tidy and have not, not ha try not to have all of my um, curves overlap because these scripts really have a tendency to get out of hand. Okay, so now what I could do is list a point of each curve, right? But so let's let's you, you see this tree is pretty complex right now. Let's let's simplify it. So let's go to set and let's let's trim this tree. That's how we simplify it. Uh, and I want to trim this tree one more time, actually. If we change this to two, I think this is what we want. Nope. Let's just trim this tree one more time. And I think this should go back to our original list, right? The first branch has four, which is my H HSS tubes, and the second branch has their 30, which are all my W and um, W and C channels. All right, so now I have this curve. What I could do is basically get the curve endpoints. And the start endpoint of the curve. Well, before then, I want to actually ins inspect these curves. So I'm, I'm going to click my mouse wheel and bake it into my Rhino viewport. And then select them and click on this analyze direction. You see that all the columns here are going up, but here are going down. So the start point is actually going to be the top. And the start point on these are going to be the bottom. And that's not not precisely correct that's not what we want really what we want is um, all of our columns be pointed upward and all of our frame elements be pointing right to left um, so let's let's flip all the directions of these in a single direction let's um, Let's go to Curve, Utility, Flip Curve. So the curve that I want to flip is this. And the Guide Curve, I want to kind of select a Smart Guide Curve. So let's go to Curve, Primitive, and do Line SDL. And the length of this line should be something completely absurd, like a 1,000. The start of this line should be vector point and just an origin point. <coughs> And the direction of this line, I want this line to go in the positive 45 degree direction and positive X, Y, and Z, if that makes sense. So I want it to go kind of just in the direction that, so that I could, so that it could, I could always be in the positive quadrant. That's, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. So do that I want to do a vector two point and my second point it's going to be an origin point but I want to s give it a one value for each axis so if we zoom in here this is my first point and this is my second you see my second is traveling in the um, positive x-axis quadrant positive x positive y and positive z so this is my direction now and you see now my line is kind of shooting out in the positive quadrant. And now I want to use this as my guide curve and plug that into here. Now if I, let's delete these, let's see if my theory works. If I bake these into Rhino and then analyze their direction, everything should be pointing in the right direction. So that now I know that if I list the start point of these columns, it'll always be the bottom point. And if I list the start point of these frames, they'll always be the left, either the left from the bottom or the left from the right. I'm sorry. Yeah, the left from the bottom or the left from the right. <clears throat> so let's delete these. I don't want them anymore. 
So now I want to get the Z point or the Z value of each start point. So go to vector and then we can do point deconstruct. And this is my Z value right here. And again, notice that the tree structure is still structured in the same manner. And you see these values are kind of all over the place. I, I can tell what, which ones are my columns because my columns were negative one. If you remember from Revit, I set my column's base to be to top of foundation, which is negative one foot below ground. So this is where we're getting that negative one from. Um, so, but what I really want here is, is, is I kind of want to round these values. I don't want to use these as my values to index my elements because this is a very laborious number. So what I want to do is go to math, utility, and do round. Plug that into here. And I want to get the ceiling value or the top value, the top bound of this. Um, so I guess I, I typically do actually see them value, but I think in this case it's actually more beneficial because you see for some reason Grasshopper is rounding that negative 1.0 to zero instead of negative one. So let's just use the nearest value instead because this is giving me what I want. And now what I want to do is kind of append a the letter L for level to the front of each value. So what I want to do is, is go to sets, text, concatenate, right click on this and symbol and under separator we want to type in Actually, we don't want to do anything. We just want to right click on A, text, and type in the letter L. And plug the output of the nearest of the mathematical round container into B. And then let's preview what's in that list. So you see it added L to 12, L to negative 1, and so on. That negative 1 is a bit tricky because it actually looks like negative dash 1. It's not, I'm sorry, L dash 1 instead of level negative 1. We'll kind of, we're, we'll pass that bridge later when we get there. But for right now, I think this will do. So this is our location. We already have our types. So let's get a concatenate. Um, we know we want three values here. Right click on here and the separator is going to be the underscore. Right here. So the first value is going to be our um, type values here. And the second is going to be this location identifier. And you see our index is shaping up. And the last one we said we want to kind of generate a unique number identifier, right? So you see this HSS L12 and HSS L12 again. Well, how do I know which one is which? So I want to uh, apply a specific like, I unique identifier to each one. And the quickest way to do that is to create a series of numbers. So we can go to set, sequence, series. And we want to start at zero, step the series by one every time, and then the count is going to be the number of steps this will happen, right? So in this case, it starts at zero, it steps one, and it counts to 10. So zero to nine is 10 numbers. What I wanted to do instead is I wanted to count to four and then 30. So we go to set list and we want to get the length of this list. So in this thing now it's listed 4 and 30. And if I plug that into my count, I should get two lists starting from 0 to 3 and then 0 to 29. The one has 4 and the other one has 30. Let's right click here and simplify. And now what I want to do is do one more append here um, as and I want to append the hashtag or the number identifier to this, to this element so that I know that this is my unique number. And then plug that into the C of my concatenate function or my concatenate container. And there goes my entire, my entire index. Now the last step that's left is basically applying this index to, to my... Um, my elements. So I already have most of this set up. All I have to do is really just take this and copy it. <clears throat> Plug. So this is going to be for my index. Remember, this is where I typed in my project parameter as. 
this is going to be my value and I could just simply let's save here before we continue I could just simply say true and that should apply that unique index to every element switch this to false and see what happens There it is. So I know that this is W section. It happens at L11 and it's number eight, right? It's a very unique thing, right? So this is, I know that this is a W section. It happens at level negative one and it's number four. And it kind of does that over and over again. So this is going to be level number 29 and so on. I think this is all I have for you for today. I think next time what we're gonna do is basically begin to construct a database that could list out each uh, each unique structural element, its section profile, its length, um, the weight per linear foot, and the weight of the member, and export that to an Excel spreadsheet so that we can start actually have it created in a database and storing it outside Revit and outside Grasshopper. And the best tool to use that, to the best tool for creating a database that is versatile across multiple diff different platforms is Excel. So that's all I have for you for today. Um, again, everyone, please make sure that you take a look at this script from start to finish and understand exactly what, what, what I covered here. I know I covered quite a bit in an hour and 20 minutes or so, hour and 15 minutes. So please email me or